Hi, everyone, and welcome to Golf's Next Gen, the official podcast of the American Junior Golf Association. My name is Tim Jackman. I am the Vice President of Communications at the AJGA. That over there is Thomas Harrison, Director of Tournament Operations. And then somewhere over there is our producer, Justin. So welcome to another episode. We've got some great stuff to talk about. Another great guest coming on. Uh, first, Thomas, I want to talk a little bit about the world of golf and what kind of what's going on. Had a big major. Obviously, the Open Championship just wrapped up some pretty crazy conditions, I think. I was looking at some of the driving distance numbers were, you know, 100 yards less or more for some of these top players out there. So, uh, Xander obviously getting it done pretty cool for him. Two major championships uh, under his belt this year. Yeah. No, I mean, like you mentioned, the conditions crazy out there. We saw, I think my favorite part of the weather conditions in a golf tournament like that is when you start seeing the backwards hats come out. <laughs> like, backwards hat Billy was just, he was out there making a run at it, so... I'm always interested to see, you know, they're in the rain gear. I mean, those conditions, it's nobody wants to be out there during that. But I think part of that, it kind of truly shows like how good these guys are. And if somebody puts together a nice round in those conditions, you really have to look at it and be like, holy cow, like Open appreciate what you golf. just saw. Yeah, and I think that's part of I love the link style, but it's. I mean, it's just a different style of golf, a different world. You know, that's coming. Like, it's impossible to have an open without it. at least one day of that. So I love it. I'm a big fan. But, like, I love seeing birdies, but give me those conditions and let's see the players. Let's oh see yeah. them play. I want to see you grind it out. I want to see, like, when Xander did and goes out there and not the best conditions and he puts together some of those rounds that you look at. And I feel like we're going to look back at the end of the year. And when you look at, you know, what was maybe the most impressive round, you're going to look at those and throw some of those in contention. But that kind of brings me into something, Tim. Again, people are asking. Not me, but people are asking. What's your favorite line? I love it because we're all about the people here. <laughs> but... With that second major win for Xander, I know where he's, you're going with this. he's starting to creep into the talks of potential player of the year, which seems on one end kind of crazy considering the start Scotty had. But I think there's a legitimate argument to be had for Xander making this push into player of the year. Oh boy, I I see what I'm, I mean. I see it. I see I see what you're saying. But like, you can't. I don't know. I feel like the. The golf is one thing. Like, obviously, with his finishes at major championships, like, that's a big deal, right? But, like, you can't just ignore the rest of the tournaments that they play in. And I feel like not just the wins that Scotty had, you know, throughout the year and how he stacked them up and how that, that stretch that he had, but I think it was really, like, I don't know, his – how he elevated himself above everything else. And it wasn't – it wasn't just the play, right? He was – he put on such a – show and elevated himself so much even just his persona if you will um which was a little bit like some of these other great runs we've seen in history that i think to me that kind of gets him over there and he's had i think obviously the major stand out the not finishing outside the top 10 the two wins but i think he's really just one of those guys streak. yeah he's got the longest cut streak on tour right now and it's just one of those things you look at like he's always there he's always in contention and obviously, Scotty's done close to the same thing this year, um, being always up in the hunt there. But Xander, for the better part of the last two years, has just been so consistent. And I think people were kind of waiting for him to get over that hump. And I think this year he's really done that. And so with that, like it's not going to shock me at all if he comes out and strings together a couple more wins here before the end of the season. I know we're starting to wind down. But to your point, where like with everything Scotty's done, say Scotty doesn't get another one the rest of the season. How many more does Xander have to win for you to be in that conversation of, you know, I think Xander topped him? I think if he wins a playoff event, I think it's – I think they're right there. I, that's – in my mind, that's it. Because that's an elevated event. That's a big deal. And it's not a major. That – I don't know. That would be my, my thought with it. I think you could make arguments either way. And you probably could make an argument for Xander now if you really wanted to. Um, I think it's going to be really hard to get Scotty out of the mind – though of the of the decision makers with this see that's right the recency bias kind of comes into play though scotty got the first one of the year and now xander's he's front of mind for people did xander get arrested though (laughs) (laughs) no he probably doesn't have as fun of a group chat photo as as scotty does but he's i mean he's he's on the front of people's minds right now he's the hot name in golf and it's good to see obviously a, a great guy who's always been very well respected by everyone in the industry everyone on tour so um, I think a lot of people are happy to see the success that he's had. But I think between the recency bias and the majors, I think he's going to start popping up in that conversation more and more. 
I can see that. I, I mean, I can get behind it. I certainly, like I said, I see it. I still think Scotty, there's just something about the feel of Scotty still just feels like it was big, bigger. Yeah. But I get it. I, I totally get it. Uh, kind of speaking of the majors, though, um, let's. I think we should do a little power rankings. So okay. why don't you give me your power rankings of the majors, and uh, we can obviously discuss. But Okay. So I want to I want to clarify for my power rankings. Are we going? <laughs> how am I ranking them? It's like my favorite. What I think is most impressive. These are your power rankings, so you. But decide. I need a criteria. Okay. I need do it. If I'm on, going my power rankings, that's probably let's a little do different. it on most impressive. Let's do that. Most impressive. Okay, I think. I think I will start with the Masters just because of the pressure and like the mystique yeah. of it all. I think even though it may not be the most challenging conditions when you consider everything it's there's nothing like augusta there's nothing like that setting that environment like that's what you're shooting for i mean you've seen it just eat people alive and that's in it's it's no disrespect to the other majors but kids are growing up talking about playing the masters like that is your goal that is people's one bucket list tournament if you could go to one event in your life it's the masters and so i think that's my clear cut number one i think it's also the only one that stays at the same course every year yeah it's it's the history behind it. You know, everyone's, you're playing that same course and they're making the renovations. They're trying to push the tees back and try to add some yardage, but you're playing those same holes the way that they were intended to be played when they were built. Um, so I think that's my clear cut one. I think kind of going back to your point, I love the challenge of like, I like, it's fun watching guys go low. It's fun watching a shootout. Like, don't get me wrong. I'll watch the John Deere Classic every week when guys are just <laughs> shooting, trying to break 30. Uh, but Love me some Midwest golf. Oh, Midwest golf. Midwest is best. Shout out the corner. <laughs> but I think, like, I love when those conditions are so tough. Like, you see a guy who's five feet off the fairway, and you're like, he has to make a shot here. Like, that ball is gone. And so I think U.S. Open conditions always – you just hear U.S. Open, you think of that thick rough – But the PGA in the last couple of years, I feel like has really made that push as well Mm -hmm. to make those super challenging conditions. And I mean, you saw at Valhalla this year, I mean, that rough was just menacing. I mean, if you were off fairway, you were just, it was punishing for you. And so I, I mean, obviously the open conditions, the weather, there's just so much that goes into it. The nostalgia, the home of golf. Come on. So I think partially for that reason, I think, I think the open is number two for me also because being called the champion golfer of the year is probably one of the cooler (laughs) things you can claim like that's just awesome like u.s open champion pga champion great champion golfer of the year yeah like give me that on a plaque put that like put that in my bio so i'll take that too you'll never be putting that in your bio sorry to burst your bubble hey never say never (laughs) qy10 give me a chance (laughs) but i think at that point i'm just flipping a coin on three and four I think depending on the venue in any yeah. given year. Yeah. I feel like the U.S. Open probably gets more notoriety than the PGA. But, mm-hmm. again, just depending on what the venue is year to year, those two probably flip for me. But yeah. What about you? What is your what is your one through four? <sighs> I actually think it's, I think it's the same. Um, the Masters, to me, you know, I think it's one thing to have a, a great golf tournament when you're kind of going to these different venues. So it's always new. It's always different. It's always changing. Even when you repeat a venue, it's still changing. Um, but to have it at the same golf course and to have that much mystique around the golf course and, you know, going through Amen corner with the lead, I can't even imagine. I did. I'd need a new pair of pants. Like it's <laughs> like, there's no way you, you get through that without it affecting you. So I think the masters for sure is number one for me. I love the open championship. I love watching that difficult golf like I was just glued really it was glued to the tv just watching you know some of these some of these shots you're like oh that's a great shot oh that's that's not a good shot and Lynx golf is just so pure like it's just like you said it's the home of golf it's the way golf was intended to be played it's just it's a totally different game it's just so pure yeah so I think I think I'm there the the U.S. Open I like that just from the standpoint of kind of the different venues that I have. I think typically like the U.S. Open venues a little bit more. Um, but the PGA, like you said, is is kind of really has gotten some teeth lately and, and with some of the different venues that they've had too. So I think three and four again, I mean, you, uh, they're almost kind of flip-flopped one way or the other depending on where they're at. So I feel like those two are very much like storyline driven too yeah, from year to year. 100%. Where 
in the open, obviously the longest day in golf. You're watching that, just watching people just grind it out, try yeah. to make, try to punch their ticket. Where the PGA as well, having those PGA professionals out there, I think is a cool yeah. added to us. Obviously, everything with Michael Block last year was really kind of brought that to the forefront where maybe a lot of people weren't as familiar that that was something that goes on. But I think it just depends to like, what's the storyline coming out of that tournament? So yeah, I think you get some good options there. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. I don't think anyone fights you if you're going to flip flop those two. I don't know if there's too many people who are like more so dead set passionate about one of those two as they are maybe the masters or the open. Yeah. Yeah. I think I agree. I agree. What you got? So Tim, something I brought and something I was looking at was, the U.S. Junior and the U.S. Girls Junior, obviously kind of spinning off that U.S. Open and everything the USGA does. I think something that's so special about that format to me is I love the stroke play. You have the medalist, then you come into the match play. And so, I mean, you just look at some of these matchups, and both of those leaderboards are obviously very AJJ heavy, as you would expect those top junior golfers. But from your perspective, is that I feel like I hear mixed feedback on the format. There are some people I feel like are very passionate about match play. Some people are more so stroke play. It's one versus everybody. What are your kind of thoughts on that whole stroke play versus match play debate? To me, it kind of falls into a couple different camps. Because if you really want like, okay, who's the best of the best? Just go out, go out, play golf. Who's the best? Then you're going to, you want stroke play, right? Because you want to put yourself up against the entire field Everybody's playing the same course. Everybody's playing the same conditions. You just go out there and you compete against the entire field. It's just you. But I think if you look from like from like a spectator standpoint, from like from just a general enjoyment standpoint, I think you I love this format because you do get some of that stroke play and you do become the medalist. Shout out to our buddy. Um, but you also get like this match play format, which I think is so entertaining. Um, and the match play format, I think you really see some of those, you know, some of those dominant personalities come through on those because it's not just about, you're not competing with yourself anymore, which is kind of big in stroke play. You're competing against someone else, you know, right, right next to you that you have to beat. So I think you really find, especially on the junior level, you really see those kids who have kind of that killer instinct, that really shows up in in these match play formats. It's really exciting. I mean, the playoff that they had to to get in good old thirteen for nine. Thirteen for nine, but it ended in one hole. So, um, but I, I I think all of those things just add kind of to the storyline of of it. So I, I like the match play from a from an entertainment standpoint and from a viewer standpoint. But if you really want to be true about this is the best player in the entire field, one hundred percent sure, then I think you you kind of have to go stroke play. Yeah. No, I would agree with that. And I think it it certainly brings a different dynamic. It's something that these players are really going to have to get used to as they go into college golf and get into that team golf where, and you'll have the individual stroke play, but the NCAA is when it comes down to it. Your team's in match play. A lot of those big uh, tournaments for those universities are match play as well. So I'm kind of with you. I think I like the mindset behind it, the mentality. I like that there are some matches where that are just so back and forth. And there are some matches where you can come out and you can be playing great golf. You can be two, three under and you're still, you're getting blown out of the water. Like some, somebody comes out hot and it's just tough. Like I know I was watching the leaderboard today and um, our player rep, Brooke Simmons, (laughs) he was on the sixth hole, uh, 371 yard par four. And he's playing Davis Ovard, another one of our juniors, great player. Davis sticks his second shot to within four feet. So he's thinking, I'm in great position. I'm looking at birdie here. Brooks holes out from about 60 yards out, and he wins the hole. Like, you just hit this phenomenal approach shot. You're thinking, oh, I'm in for birdie. I've just got to go up. Just give this one some legs, and I'm good. Somebody holes out, and then you're down. Right. And so it's the birdie doesn't even help you. So I do like that kind of aspect that, one, you're always kind of one great shot away in match play from kind of turning the tides where say you have a bad hole in stroke play, you have a blow up hole. You could have played better golf than everyone else. The rest of the week. If something goes haywire, you can be out of luck. I think back to, to Nelly when she on the par three, was it carded to 12 um, after the streak she was on. And so after the first day, I mean, she was, she was nine over through three holes and it kind of took her out of it. And so she had a good rest of tournament fought back from there, but you take yourself out of it on one hole where I think for me, the match play, it gives you the opportunity where obviously every single hole is a new competition. And um, 
I like kind of the beauty of that aspect of it is you can kind of reset and not let things snowball there. Yeah. Yeah, I think, too, you know, the match play I think is good also because, you know, what is it, a knock on kind of the U.S. juniors and stuff coming up through with, you know, whether it's the Ryder Cup or the Solheim Cup or the President's Cup. Like, they don't have a lot of match play experience. I mean, that's one thing we do with some of our match play events we do, whether that's, you know, the Junior Solheim Cup or the Junior President's Cup or we just had the Wyndham Cup um, and kind of the the match play experience that you get there playing all the different formats, playing with a, a partner you know, playing some of those singles matches, you know, having that experience is very important when you kind of get to that next level when you're starting to represent your country or your region, you know, or whatever that is. Um, kind of some cool, some cool experience there that I think a lot of a lot of players don't always have. So I think it is important to have some of those kind of match play, those match play things. Yeah, no, I think I would completely agree, and I think that's why I love the timing of where our Wyndham Cup falls, and so. It'll be great to have Megan on here shortly to talk about her experience with Wyndham Cup because it falls right at a time for these boys and girls where the girls are basically going straight from Wyndham Cup to the U.S. Girls Junior. The guys have just a little bit of a break, and then they're right into the boys' junior. So it's they're coming off that match play. They're a little familiar, especially that last day of singles. It always gets nice and competitive, and that's something I'm really looking forward to talking with Megan about is just that kind of mindset that last day when the cup's on the line. And yeah. you know you're only responsible for one point, but – that one point can be huge like we saw. So uh, I'm yeah. really looking forward to kind of digging deeper into that with Megan. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think uh, she's ready for us. So we'll go ahead and get her on here and um, have find out a little bit about Wyndham Cup and some other stuff she's got going on. So Megan, thanks so much for joining us this, uh, I guess this afternoon. Uh, where did you just come from? You were on the golf course, right? Yeah, I just finished up playing my last day at the Pennsylvania Woman's Am. Nice. Nice. How'd that go for you? Um, went pretty well. Finished fourth. I played with a lot of college golfers, so it was really nice. Very cool. I'm sure that's obviously got to be a little bit of a different experience going from juniors to um, a little bit of an older age group. Does does that change the mentality at all? Do you kind of feel yourself looking at the game any differently? Um, not really. I feel like, especially with amateurs, like it's a lot like junior golf in so many ways. So you don't really have to change anything up, do all the same things that you already know how to do. You've kind of had a busy, busy couple of months though of golf, right? Because you went Wyndham Cup, and then you, you, what did you play after Wyndham Cup? Um, I went straight to U.S. Girls right after Wyndham Cup. How was that experience? It was so awesome. The fact that they had U.S. Girls out in L.A. was something special. I feel like it was so awesome to be out at El Caballero Golf Club because, like. Obviously, there's a lot of um, history there, and especially just like the surrounding area. It's just so beautiful. Oh, very cool. And we were actually, just before you came on, talking a little bit about this stretch and some of that different format than maybe what you're used to playing in the stroke play with Wyndham Cup falling at seemingly the perfect time for you ladies going straight then into the U.S. Girls Junior. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that transition and what that kind of feels like playing more of that match play style versus the traditional stroke play that you play seemingly the rest of the year. Yeah. I feel like I've played so much match play just like this last month. Cause I played the polo. So the RLX up at Beth page, which is just all match play. And then I went straight to win them like a couple weeks later, which is just all match play. And then I played us girls with, which has match play after the stroke play. So I feel like, the mentality when you play match play is definitely going to be way different just because you have to be winning holes. It's not just making parts, making birdies. And I feel like the competitiveness comes out just like among everybody, especially in match play. And so you really just have to make sure everything in your game is in perfect form and you really just got to put some pressure on your opponents. Are you one of those kind of petty match play golfers that makes people mark like one foot putts or are you kind of forgiving? I feel like I'm forgiving, like just overall, like I'm friendly with pretty much all the girls that I play with. And so like, it's funny because you play with the girls that you're like best friends with and it's like a match. And so it's like, you're not going to be that mean to them. <laughs> when you're playing your friends though, do you find yourself like, is there a brief period of time where you're looking at it and thinking like, we're not friends right now. Like this is, this is intense. <laughs> um, I feel like a little bit, you know, you got to separate the business and the pleasure <laughs> <laughs> i like that you're coming out here this is a business first mentality that's that's what i like that killer mindset but are there any of those matches that you can think of where 
in particular, you kind of had that mindset of like, all right, it's enough fun and games. I've kind of got to turn it on now. Um, I guess like at Wyndham Cup, I was paired like in the girls uh, four, four ball or alternate shot um, against one of my good friends, Asterix. And she is like an absolute killer offer. And so she's also just like one of my favorite people ever. And we were against each other for the alternate shot. And so she really turned it on. Like I was, I was playing pretty well that entire round too, but like watching her sink putts, I was like admiring how good of a golfer she is, but also <laughs> like she's my opponent, you know? <laughs> right. So talk a little bit about Wyndham Cup. What was that experience like for you? Um, Wyndham Cup was so much fun. This year was my second year playing for the East team. And so just like in general, I feel like that whole tournament is just so special. There's just like nothing really like it. And the fact that you're like living with all the other golfers and you have your captains taking care of you the whole week, it just doesn't even feel like any other junior golf tournament. It feels like you're kind of like with the family and you have to support your team in every way you can. No, it's very cool. And I think one of the things that a lot of people we talk to kind of look back on is the fact that at the Wyndham Cup, not only do you do the foursomes and four ball, but you do mixed foursomes and mixed four ball. So what is that like playing with somebody who you obviously are usually not paired with in competitive events? Yeah, I feel it, especially with like AJGA events, you don't necessarily play with the guys a lot if you're like playing the girls tournaments and things like that. And so like when we get to do mixed four ball, it's like so interesting because I feel like the way like the girls might approach golf might be different than the guys or just like the way they play. Generally, you like pick up on things. And so I feel like you, I learned a lot from playing alternate shot um, in the mixed four ball, just like, cause the whole entire format is just so different. It's nothing I've ever done before. Was there like a moment or an experience or story or something that stuck out to you? Where you're like, wow, this is really different. And this is really cool. Um, I think maybe like last year, the first year I played Wyndham cup, um, I was playing mixed four ball um and i remember one of the holes my partner he drove it like straight into the water on one of the holes (laughs) after we had discussed like exactly where he was supposed to be hitting it and it was like he was like i'm sorry and i was like it's totally okay and we ended up winning the hole and it was perfectly fine but it was like you have to be forgiving with your um partner sometimes (laughs) i love that i know in the um in the professional event where sahith and rose were paired together and they asked, uh, the tour did a segment and they're like, what's the one rule that you guys have this week or something that you guys talked about? And they're like, there's just no saying sorry. Like there's, you know, you're going to mess up. There's just no going out there and saying sorry. So love hearing that. Cause I do think that's something where I would just personally, I'm <laughs> disclaimer, not a high level competitive golfer, but I don't think I'd be able to get that out of my mind. I think I would be apologizing the entire time if I hit a bad shot. <laughs> yeah. Especially in all shot. I uh, apologize for after every hot shot I hit anyways, even if I'm not in match <laughs> play, so that's a little tough. Um, you played in a bunch of different formats, right? What do you feel like getting that experience in match play? How do you feel like that's important for you as a, a golfer, not just now, but kind of in the next steps in your golf career? Yeah, definitely being able to play match play rather than just stroke play makes you is like forces your game to be more flexible and it forces you to like test those areas that you might not necessarily have. Like you got to be able to make putts under pressure. You have to be able to make the clutch shots and especially all the, all these different formats, it like brings out all the weaknesses in your game. So it kind of shows you what you're good at and what you need to capitalize on. And I feel like it's also just such a fun experience because like um, we never play things like this and it's just so fun to be able to, be with your friends and playing with them not just against them i guess we should probably say congrats we didn't say that on on the east's win so that's a big deal right um definitely since first time since 2021 with that victory but uh kind of along those lines what the team golf aspect of it is kind of a little bit different too than what you typically do can you talk about that and how you maybe feel that prepares you a little bit for you know college and the next level yeah definitely i feel like Being able to have all those team chats, all those pep talks before you go off to play, all those like rally chants and things like that, it like prepares you for college and the fact that you are working alongside all these other people and they're supporting you just as much as you're supporting them. So normally, like if you go out and play, like 
you you have yourself to play for but like when you're playing on that team it's like you really want to play well because there's a lot of people riding on you too so it puts a lot of pressure on you but it also feels like such a good community and did you ever find yourself in a situation where you're out there and you're the one kind of trying to coach somebody else up and if so how do you kind of approach that being a fellow player and not somebody who's in that kind of elevated coach's role that would typically be the one giving the advice oh yeah so when they let us caddy and they let us like um carry the bag for one of our teammates that I found it's that's just like one of my most favorite parts of Wyndham Cup because it's just like you're not the player in that moment you have to be helping someone else and this year when I was caddying I was like I felt like I was giving some advice like here and there and our match that I was caddying for was coming like really tight at the end so I felt like I was doing my best to keep my players calm and like like comfortable because obviously like tension can get high so I was just trying to make sure everybody was like drinking their water and like taking care of themselves you know but it's not always easy to be the caddy I was say did you have like a newfound respect for being a caddy after you were the one on the bag for a match yeah like a hundred percent you just have to know the right things to say and like what your player wants from you at that very moment and sometimes that's not always easy yeah. Speaking of coaches, you had a captain and a captain's assistant. Talk a little bit about that and their experience. Um, I promised Oski I'd give him a shout out on the podcast. So why don't you talk about that? Yeah. Shout out um, Captain Oski and assistant captain Abby. I absolutely loved having them both as the captains this year. I feel like Oski especially, he just like gives off just like fatherly captain vibes like he's always like telling us he's always like supporting us like he just always knows what to say and when to say it and just makes um, so he always sense. like rounds us up he's he's like making fun of people like half the time it's just like it's great and I feel like especially as a captain all you want is to feel like supported and like that he's there for you and so like both of them did such a great job this year I felt like our team was very united as a whole. And that's like sometimes hard to do, especially with a bunch of teenage kids. Yeah. In case people don't know, Oski is uh, the AJGA's chief operating officer, Mark Oskerson. So uh, he's been doing that for a long time and he was certainly happy to get a, another win for the East team under his belt this, this year. So no, that was huge for him. And part of that with him being a captain is I have to know, because in the office, Oski is the biggest nickname guy. Every person he passes has a new nickname every single day, whether it makes any sense or not. So is he giving nicknames to the people on the team or were you guys giving any nicknames or how did that whole situation play out? I think like our team, like we came up with nicknames for each other here and there. We had a lot of like team sayings. I feel like every year, like this year and also last year, we came up with like team sayings that we would always say. So um overall I think like Oski just like finds a way to grow like (laughs) kind of become like closer with all the kids like in that way but I feel like um I can't remember any nicknames from this year but we had a lot of team sayings it was fun love that love that uh well let's move kind of on from Wyndham Cup what's the rest of your 2024 looking like tournament wise or kind of goals wise um, I only have one more tournament this summer. It'll be my last junior tournament. And then I'm off to play some college golf and move out for college. So I'm excited. I'll be going to Northwestern this fall. Very cool. And so with that, obviously that is a huge part of your junior career is that recruiting process. What did that process look like for you and what made you eventually pick Northwestern? Um, the recruiting process was not so long for me. I it, you can only start talking to coaches on June 15th after your sophomore year. So I started talking to coaches around then and I ended up committing in like late October, but like that whole entire summer, I feel like sometimes it can be overwhelming, but it's always important to remember that coaches are just like real people and that you can just like have a conversation with them. And so I think the recruiting process went well for me. I got to get to see what's out there. And that's always really important because um, I feel like there's so much to offer in the college golf world. What are you looking forward to the most about college golf? Um, I'm so excited to play for Northwestern. I absolutely love my coach, Coach Emily. Um, And just like my whole team, I'm excited to be just like on a team for the first time and getting to travel to play these tournaments with them. 
Oh, that's very cool. I think that's something that it's always positive for us on the AJGA side as we look and see these players that we've kind of seen grow up through those ranks and they finally get to college golf. And then when you hear from them a couple years later and they're just, they love their whole experience. I feel like that's kind of what it's all about for us. So it's exciting to see when you're talking about, you're so much looking forward to that team side and going there that that's kind of becoming a reality since I feel like that's really what we're trying to do here. So no, super cool on that end. And um, again, going up to the Midwest, I know you're going to be up there getting a good taste of that cold weather up in Chicago, but um, Big Ten golf, I feel like it's pretty underrated. It's, you know, you've had teams making a run at it. And obviously with the shakeups and the divisions, I feel like Big Ten golf is only going to continue to get better here. Yeah, I feel like Big Ten golf is going to be really crazy this next year. And I'm also just excited to play because I know there's just so many competitive schools out there. And so it's going to be so much fun. That's awesome. How do you feel like the AJGA kind of helped you prepare you for college golf and beyond? Um, in so many ways, but mostly like the AJGA, like pushes golfers to play at the highest level. I feel like just the way every tournament is set up and like the competition, it's just like the strength of the field and all the other people there. It's like you have to work hard and play consistently well. And the only way you can really get that experience is through tournaments like that. And so I feel like in the same way that college golf is going to be extremely competitive, it just like prepares you by letting you get a taste of it before you get there. And so with that junior golf experience that you navigated and you're finding yourself winding down on, what is one thing if you could like look back and one thing you could tell yourself, what would it be now that you're kind of winding down? Um, probably to say thank you to more of the interns and all the staff because you guys and your jobs are not like easy. And I feel like a lot of the time I'm there and I'm focused on the tournament and I never really noticed how smoothly everything goes until it's over. And so like, definitely thank you to you guys because you guys are great at your jobs. Just let you guys know. Um, and oh, then also like, so so nice. <laughs> also to like, <laughs> Also to like spend um, time appreciating like all the nice courses we play and all the people you get to play them with because like so many of the golfers that I've played junior golf with for these last few years, like I know they're all going to do great things and it, it's so amazing that we're all here together playing now. So I just think that's really cool. No, that's super cool. Like I said, we appreciate it. We, we enjoy watching you guys go and succeed. And so one thing that I become a fan of on this podcast is I have to ask the question of having you make a prediction for us in what year do you win your first LPGA event? Ooh. Okay. Mm, okay. So since it's 2024 right now and I want to, I think I'm going to, I want to hopefully play either four years or like just get a, a little bit of college experience. Definitely. So maybe like 20, 30, Ooh, I like it. I like that. See, we've heard some people, some people have gotten aggressive. I think Jasmine was talking like a year and a half and she's like, I'll have my first one. And then she short, almost did it. <laughs> yeah. And then she almost did it um, like a week later. So that was kind of crazy, but I yeah, like Jasmine's putting some thought best. into it. <laughs> she, I mean, the confidence was there and then you saw what she can go out and do. And you're like, the talent is clearly there too. So she may not be too far off, but I like that. Getting the, getting the taste of college and that full experience. And then 2030 we'll be watching for Megan Mang on the leaderboard. <laughs> yeah. Jasmine has some unmatched confidence. I actually like love that about her. <laughs> she was, she was a great guest. We loved having her on for sure. Um, I think that's kind of basically what we wanted to chat about with you, Megan. I hope you uh, kind of enjoyed talking with us and some of the stuff we really appreciate, you know, you playing in AJGA tournaments and obviously playing in the Wyndham Cup and some of these other big events gets you some great experience, but um, definitely great watching you play and we're kind of wishing you the best as you move on into college and beyond. Thank you so much for having me. No, thanks again, Megan. We really appreciate it. Best of luck as you move forward. And, um, you know, being the big Midwest fans we are, we'll be keeping track of all the Big Ten golf, everything you're doing at Northwestern. So best of luck to you. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Megan. We'll talk to you later. All right. Have a good one. Yeah, awesome to have Megan on with us. She is really 
accomplished junior golfer, got a lot of top finishes in the AJGA, and really cool to hear about those Wyndham Cup experiences. I mean, Wyndham Cup is just just a crazy event. It's so much fun. I've had the privilege of going and, and covering a few of them, and just the feeling that you get there, you can't describe. It's just so cool to experience that event. I can't imagine playing in that and kind of all the hype and stuff that goes along with it. Yeah, no, I have haven't been lucky enough to go to one yet. Don't quite have your tenure yet, Tim, so... <laughs> We'll leave that to you, but something I always just hear great things about. It's one that players are always talking about on the front end, like how do I qualify for Wyndham Cup? How do I get in? They're they're excited. So I feel like it's been a team golf heavy episode, but we're kind of in that time of year where at least for the AJGA, this is where all those team events fall. So yeah. uh, if you've been following the podcast, you've probably enjoyed our segment with our executive director Stephen Hamblin and telling a lot of his golf stories of a lot of these famous golfers before you maybe knew them before they were a household name. So um, we're going to give it over to Steven and he's going to tell us a story about Jessica Corda at another one of our team events, the Ping Junior Solheim Cup. Tom, Tim, thank you again for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. I do have a, a neat story. You know, Nellie's getting all the headlines uh, these days and rightly so, but it was her sister that came onto the AJGA first and I remember playing in a junior am with her uh, during the Ping Junior Solheim Cup. And I was excited to play with her because she was such a terrific player. And we get out, we're going to start on a par three. It's about 165 yards uphill. And uh, I grab my six and seven iron. I'm playing with Jason Miller, who's a good player. He grabs his six and seven iron, and we go to the tee. Uh, Jessica hits first, and we're playing from her tee markers. He, she hits this beautiful, smooth, high draw in there about 10 feet from the hole, pin high. And uh, I said, well, Jessica, what'd you hit? She goes, oh, just a little two-fingered eight iron. And I looked at Jason Miller. I go, it's going to be a long day. Thanks again, Stephen, for coming on. It's always cool hearing some of those stories about the big names back when they were at the same level of our juniors working through that process. But I think my favorite part about that is hearing about the two-finger eight iron. And, <laughs> Tim, I just have to wonder, is that a shot that you think you have in the bag? <laughs> uh, I think we probably know the answer to that question. Uh, it's definitely a no. I am not hitting an eight iron on that hole. I will tell you that much. What club are you pulling out of the bag right there? Uh, that's probably, why is it driver? <laughs> that's probably at least six. I mean, to be honest, it's probably six. I have a hard time getting compression on the golf ball and that I, so a lot, I just have to make sure that I get the distance and I'm typically one of those who's going to be like, huh, well, if I think it's this club, I'm going to go ahead and add a club. So I make sure I at least get it there. Do you ever find yourself on whether it's you're on Instagram scrolling or you're on TikTok? I feel like sometimes I get down a rabbit hole of like stock yardage videos or different things like what's in the bag videos. I think that's just you. It might be just me. <laughs> golf guy, huge golf guy. <laughs> but I think one of the things that's always crazy to me when I'm watching like the stock yardages and people are running through them is I think that's one thing you see with like those high level golfers and professional golfers is their short irons. That yardage is so much yeah. longer than just the average golfer, it's like huge the 10, 15 handicapper. Yeah. So I feel like you get into those long irons, and there are some people who obviously you can, when you're swaying hard with those long irons, like you can put a little pop in it, but you look at those and it's like, all right, nine iron is 175 to like 183. And I'm thinking like, that's not what my nine iron does. That's, <laughs> no. that's not where I'm at. <laughs> no. You know, I uh, earlier this year I took one of our flight scopes um, and I took it out on the range and I just hit a bunch of balls and just got a bunch of yardages. And, it, you know, it actually was really helpful because I think a lot of, like, amateur golfers have in their mind, like, what their stock yardages are, but, like, they may or may not be super accurate. So I think it is really helpful to go and, you know, get some of those stock yardages dialed in, see what you do with some different clubs um, and what you feel comfortable doing also because I think, like you said, a lot of people can hit some clubs hard and do the, get these yardages and stuff, but what you feel comfortable with each club and what your, your number is – kind of that you're looking for with each of your clubs and I, it honestly helped me a lot I mean you can't really tell by my scores but I think it, it helped me a lot Post the score Tim <laughs> I post, post the score. I post all of my scores but I think it's it's really good a really good idea kind of from a just an amateur golfer standpoint yeah no I I love taking the flight scope out it's always a fun time because like I, I feel like you're 
you're kind of learning something. I was a huge, obviously the Taylor made like now the new thing with the new TB five and TB five X is like half club longer. So I was like, all right, take some new balls out and see what it's all about. Those things are hot. You've got some action on the new ball. <laughs> I wish I could say that that would make any sort of a difference for me, but I do, I do like the tail golf ball. I'll say that. Hey, the new ball's hot. That's all you need. <laughs> the new ball is hot. Love it. <laughs> all right. Well, I have, that's, I mean, that's pretty much. You got anything else? No, I think, again, feel like it was a team golf heavy episode, but really, I mean, it's just a cool thing for us. And obviously as we're getting into the end of the year here, we're going to have, um, a ping junior swim cup and a junior president's cup. So exciting time for the AJGA, a lot of team golf. So Big September. Um, as you're, as you're at home, make sure you're following along those leaderboards. You're going to see a lot of names that you will hear for years to come in the game of golf. So, um, should be an exciting end of the summer season here. Yeah, for sure. Well, if you have any questions, send those over to us on social media. The handle is at AJGA golf and that's on everything X, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, if that's your thing, and uh, certainly all the other channels as well. So send us those DMs if you have any questions. We'll talk about some of them on the air. Uh, But Thomas, appreciate the time today. I thought it was another great episode, and uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. Until next time, Tim. Bye.